Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. Michael Branch bringing this to our attention. Ripple CTO reacts to a mysterious 410 million XRP transfer. That's not the mysterious part though. The transfer had a strange 20 XRP gas fee. For those of you guys who are familiar with the XRP ledger, you know that uh, you know it doesn't take that much XRP to sign a transaction. So why such a high gas fee? Things that make you go, hmm. So David Schwartz did comment on this. This has sparked considerable curiosity among the XRP army due to its unusual details. The development has prompted Ripple's chief technology officer, David Schwartz, to add additional insight to unravel the details of the transactions. Specifically, pro XRP enthusiast Saul took to X to share his discovery while exploring XRP Scan, a prominent XRPL explorer. He claims to have noticed the activation of an XRP address on October the 11th, okay? So that's the first clue. However, what raised his curiosity was the astonishing inflow of 410 million XRP to the newly created wallet alongside the associated fee. And the associated fee, guys, was 20 XRP. Usually, uh, as it states down here, it is 0.00001 XRP. So uh, not a huge fee. As a result, though, Saul brought this to the attention of the XRP community and asked this, is it normal for a payment to have a fee like this, 20 XRP? And he also posted a screen grab just uh, showing that it is a 20, in fact, 20 XRP fee. Uh, the transaction was 410.699 uh, million XRP. Vet down here saying, no, definitely not. 20 XRP fee is overkill. So then this caught the eye of David Schwartz. And David Schwartz said this, I wonder if they meant to set the fee to 20 drops and were off by a factor of a million. So he said they could have set the fee to 20 XRP, which would be about 10 bucks, uh, but we're off by a factor of a million. As you guys know, the XRPL can send transactions for fractions of pennies, uh, as it's stated here, 0.00001 XRP. That would be 10 drops or 20 drops. That would be uh, a little more likely. However, we are seeing uh, a very strange fee of 20 XRP. Who knows? It could just be a mistake. Another unusual transaction on the XRP ledger. So I wanted to thank Michael for bringing that to our attention. Of course, you know, custody and cryptocurrency is going to be front and center. Uh, not so much for retail, because I feel like, you know, holding our uh, cold wallet storage solutions like a Ledger Nano, this is how we custody our cryptocurrency, you know, similar to, uh, you know, if you have a vault in your house and uh, you have the combination kind of hidden somewhere, or maybe a safety deposit box at a bank, uh, you know, somewhere physical where you can hold your cryptocurrency. Well, you know, the institutions, they want a secure method to do this. And so, uh, you know, it, it was an interesting move when Ripple did acquire Medico. Sento Sumo Saba here posted this. Okay, this week, medico.com slash talks. If I bring this up here, they're doing a presentation. Join us for a live Medico Talks event on Thursday, the 19th of October, 2023. Uh, and we're hosting Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO at Ripple Guys, on the agenda. Here's what they're going to talk about, the paradigm shift towards the internet of value. So, uh, not so much, that's the first point on the agenda, not so much custody in crypto, but the fact that everybody is going to need so much crypto that the internet is changing, you know, th there's, there's going, this is going to be a huge shift that is unprecedented and people, I mean, namely investors, company owners, whoever's using the, the technology, they're going to need to understand how it works. So even just understanding the internet of value and why you're going to need to custody so much cryptocurrency with Medico is uh, first and foremost on the agenda, okay? Secondly, Ripple's role in assisting both financial and non-financial firms in navigating this transition, okay? So here we have Ripple saying, okay, and here's what you gotta do in order to get ready for this. Strategic considerations underpinning Ripple's emphasis on institutional digital asset infrastructure, assessing the market potentials and grasping the essential requirements for its complete realization. And number four, what lies ahead for Ripple and the collaboration between Ripple and Medico. So that is the least interesting point in my mind. Reading between the lines though, looking at all these other points uh, really does spell something that they want their institutional clients to be ready for and not be left behind. The internet of value, right? Needing how many different cryptocurrencies to perform how many different transactions? Well, you know, a lot of these can take place on the XRP ledger. And in that case, you know, XRP is generally the most efficient cryptocurrency to be conducting these transactions. But of course, uh, you know, it is an interoperable blockchain and uh, depending on what companies want to do, there might be another cryptocurrency that they'll need to purchase or that they'll need to use in order to conduct these transactions. So a bit of an educational event, guys. In this morning's video, I did also talk a 
little bit about education, how the IMF is pushing it and how Ripple simultaneously are also pushing the education. And even here too, uh, you know, the education is front and center. And this is why Brad is doing this talk at Medico Talks. I will link this morning's video up here in the top right hand corner, uh, but wanted to thank Sento Sumo Saba just for posting that. We've also got this, guys, the Japanese consortium of banks that are committed to RippleNet technology, MUFG, uh, uh, Fujitsu, NTT Data. They're just three part of this consortium that are looking at a decentralized identity project. So private Japanese firms have begun exploring decentralized identities, forming a consortium to spearhead this joint venture. Eight firms came together to launch the Digital Identity, or the DID, and variable, uh, Verifiable Credential Co-Creation Consortium to explore new use cases. The firms include banking giants, MUFG, uh, the law, uh, law office Anderson uh, Mori, and Tomotsun, uh, and several Web3 firms, including Fujitsu, Itochu, uh, Topan Digital, and NTT Data. So uh, not all these guys are banks, excuse me, but uh, the banks that are part of this are part of that consortium of banks that are committed to RippleNet. So Digital ID, just kind of that next step, right? Or part of the Internet of Value. The consortium will pursue several, uh, several, sell, ugh, several, no, not even several. We'll pursue self-sovereign identity functionalities, allowing users greater control over their details. Uh, the privately run DID project could have several uses in a local economy, including streamlining know your customer processes and finance. The initial group of firms participated in the DID project encourages other companies to join the consortium. The consortium cast a wide net, urging educational firms, blockchain-based companies, and financial service providers to join the league. So essentially streamlining uh, KYC, of course, this is going to be important in this new tokenized economy, especially if we're going to be tokenizing everything. We need to know that the right people are performing the right tasks or, uh, you know, the right transactions. We don't want, uh, you know, they want to prevent identity theft, identity fraud. It's also a good way for government to track who is doing what. So that is the uh, the other part of the thing that I'm not too keen on. But I get why, you know, I get why they're saying it. I get why they're doing it. If the world is becoming tokenized, I mean, this is the next logical step. See right here, as digitization seeps into every facet of the global economy, digital IDs are quickly becoming popular. With uh, the Philippines, Twala, the National Payment Corporation of India, NPCI, which is also coincidentally a Ripple partner, and Argentina exploring solutions in the area as well. Privately run digital ID offerings like WorldCoin, remember that debacle, have triggered a regulatory clampdown in several jurisdictions like Kenya, Germany, and Argentina moving against its iris scanning project. I would never trust this type of technology uh, with a private company or the government for that matter. But, uh, you know, when you're <laughs> when you're just this company saying, yeah, just uh, scan your iris here and we'll give you a cookie or whatever they <laughs> they promise you at the end of it. I, I don't get why people do that. Anyway, an interesting project here. We can see where it's going, guys. And uh, these Ripple committed Japanese banks, part of this consortium now for a decentralized identity project. Interesting news. And we're also seeing this from the Reserve Bank of Australia, which is also a Ripple partner. Tokenization could save $11 billion, not million, $11 billion annually for Australia alone. So yes, you can see why they are deciding to do this. Brad Jones, Assistant Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, today shared the central bank's research on the impact of DLT and tokenization on Australia's capital markets. Its hypothetical estimates found up to $4 billion in annual uh, transaction cost reductions and another $13 billion in reduced cost of capital, guys. The central bank will outline its central bank digital currency CBDC roadmap in mid-2024. So Australia, they're set to go, ready to roll. Tokenization could lead to big increases in trading volume, resulting in tighter bid-ask spreads. Uh, the figures are based on declines and spreads achieved historically following innovation. We note that the BIS published research on the impact of DLT and spreads for asset-backed securities and found significant improvements. The Australian figures reflect similar benefits. And so uh, what were these figures, you ask? Matthew L-I-N-Y brought us some of these numbers, okay? The Reserve Bank of Australia tokenized assets could save the bank billions of dollars. As we've noted, two simulations show about four to $13 billion saved roughly. So guys, here it is, the report, a tokenized future for the Australian financial system. We know it's going this way. We know these guys are already connected to Ripple. The tokenization of assets presents some interesting possibilities for the digital era. Before setting out why, a few clarifications are in order, starting with some of the features that might distinguish a tokenized financial financial ecosystem. And so they give a table here, uh, stylized evolution of wholesale asset market technology. So going from the physical to the tokenized and some of the categories here, like platforms for trading settlement and ownership records 
uh, and how that is already happening right now. Information updating, uh, the physical is delayed, electronic is delayed, tokenized means it's more rapid, of course, uh, the role for intermediary, central, central, and then less market making and reconciliation if you have it uh, tokenized. Uh, operating hours, obviously we know 24-7, uh, you know, anything can run on the blockchain at all times of the day. Servicing functionality, manual, increasingly automated, and advanced programmability. So we can see already the benefit. They're already pushing this tokenized infrastructure even better than, uh, you know, what they had set out from before. Ooh, everything's going to be on computers. Well, guys, this is computers on steroids. Another graph here, hypothetical transaction cost savings. Just giving you two some factors with regards to the cost savings. And I will link all this in the description of the video for you in case you are interested. Obviously, they're seeing the benefits here, the reduction of cost. Uh, Matthew L-I-N-Y also links the, uh, the government link there in the description of this uh, tweet thread. So it's all there for you guys if you're interested in looking into it further. A tokenized world is ultimately going to mean more demand for those cryptocurrencies that solve real world problems. And, you know, more and more I'm thinking maybe we're going to see this uh, real world utility commence in a meaningful capacity, meaning we will see true demand for cryptocurrencies like XRP and XLM and Algorand and HBAR and Quant and XDC, all those cryptocurrencies where we see true value. We are, and the hypothesis goes as such, going to see it coincide with the top of the bull run 2025 because the liquidity will already be in the market. You know, if we're looking at the XRP chart here, and even if we were to take a conservative estimate from this top to the bottom, at the 4.236, we could see an XRP of over $7, about $7.5. Taking the measurement from our original all-time high though, guys, bringing that to the bottom, the trough of the market, that could mean an XRP worth about $13, but guys, take into consideration, if this happens, if we do see real world utility coincide with the spec bull run because of the liquidity in the markets, I mean, the only reason would be because those cryptocurrencies would already be so liquid that they could take that, harness it and run with it, that we'll see these prices go much, much higher. And uh, I mean, I'm hoping that's what we're going to see. I'm not suggesting that is 100% what we're going to see, but it is a theory. Cash to here. Also noticing this, XRP volume by currency update. So guys, this is how much money right now is flowing into XRP through different cryptocurrencies, different fiat currencies, like the Korean won is number one up here. So Korean won uh, represents about 48.97% of uh, the purchasing of XRP. USDT is at about 37.32%. Then we got USD, Bitcoin, USDC, and uh, many other fiats following that. Uh, then we got numbers here continuing here, uh, Great British Pound. We got the Canadian dollar here, the Brazilian real, uh, so on and so forth. So interesting to note that uh, Korea still represents a large portion of this. I mean, this is all good to note. And I mean, truly, this doesn't even represent what we could see and will likely see once we do, in fact, see that real world utility. And if, uh, you know, we continue with this theory that we could see it in 2025 or at least begin in 2025 at the height of the bull run, you'll have that XRP liquidity being drummed up by FOMO. But then on top of that, to supercharge it, the real demand hitting guys, these numbers will be blown out of the water, but it takes time and patience. And so from Lord XRP here, a glitch again. Why are we only seeing glitches on the XRP chart guys today, which was yesterday? He did notice this 150 million plus users chose to register today. I think this is from Binance, but guys, check it out over here. XRP glitch equals 4,394 Swiss francs. That is CHF is equal to one XRP. Now, how much is that really? CH, CH, F to XRP. Can we get a reading on that? Well, as you can see here from Google, it is only supposed to be 2.24 Swiss francs. So if it was in fact 4394, that would be the equivalent to about 9855 XRP. So 9855 XRP to USD. 9855 XRP would equate to about $4,871 USD per XRP, guys. Why do we keep seeing these glitches? Why, 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 and why, guys? Is it only for XRP? I keep asking myself, if you do see any other glitches for any other cryptocurrencies, do let me know because right now all we're seeing are the XRP glitches. What is happening behind the scenes where we're seeing these glitches? Are they preparing us for a tokenized future? Isn't it interesting how Brad Garlinghouse is the one too to have to educate people on the internet of value tokenization. Everything is going to be running on the XRP ledger. This also does shine some new light on this abnormal 20 XRP fee. 
All things that make me go, hmm, but that's just my opinion. I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.